Great to be with you guys today. Uh, beautiful Lord's Day outside, and uh, I'm excited because we are a church on the move. Uh, if, you're, if you're a guest with us today, we welcome you, and uh, you come at a great time in the history and the life of the Simi Valley Church of Christ. Uh, it's been a busy first quarter in 2019, and um, uh, you've you probably noticed a lot of changes, some changes in our environment uh, as part of the remodel. Uh, we've changed and added uh, uh, new Bible classes, everything from the website to uh, how we welcome and, and try to be the most welcoming people to uh, those that are visiting with us uh, has really taken hold here at the Simi Church of Christ, and I believe God is at work and is blessing our congregation on a daily basis. And uh, with that, it's really been on my mind uh, what happens when you ask God uh, for something and all of a sudden He delivers, right? All of a sudden, uh, things, get, uh, things start happening that you ask to happen. Are you ready for that? And uh, it's really been on my heart this, this message of uh, being a servant. And what does it mean to minister uh, and be the vehicle of God's blessing out in a broken world, uh, which is our calling? And uh, so, uh, you know, I was exploring uh, online, and, and I found a, a, a sermon by a guy by the name of Colin Smith. Uh, it's on unlockingthebible.org, and this guy has a beautiful Irish accent, and he delivers it with all of these rolling R's, and uh, uh, makes it sound really amazing. Uh, I will make it sound less amazing, but uh, excerpts from that uh, sermon are, are what I'm going to use today. So if you want to see that full uh, sermon online, you can certainly see me afterwards. Um, but uh, we're here to talk about servanthood today. And in order to do that, uh, we've got to kind of look at what, what the story of God is and what, what is the entire story. The Bible is one story. We start by learning that the world and everything in it belongs to God. In the beginning, God. We can't understand the world that we live in unless we understand the God that made it. And we can't understand our purpose in our own lives unless we know the God that made us. So in the story, as it goes, something really terrible happens. Sin and rebellion. Now the great story in the Bible is what does God choose to do to redeem the world to himself and how does he save and deliver people out of that sin and rebellion? Now, God's first priority is to make himself known. Even in uh, the beginning, he comes to Adam and Eve and he says, Adam, where are you? Even Abraham, God says, I will make you a great nation and I will bless all nations through you. God's blessing will break into the world with amazing stories of triumph. God states his blessings will flow through the line of Abraham and follow right through. And we can see how that these descendants of Abraham and how he will use them to channel his blessings into the world. Now, from a historical perspective, uh, there's something like 1,300 years be between Abraham and this story that we're going to read today in Isaiah. And if you look at it, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of progress in that time. God's people have become a great nation. They've been liberated from Egypt. They've been given their promised land. They've been handed God's wonderful laws. God asks the people to be a light unto the world, a kind of model community for other people to follow. But it's been a little disappointing. Instead, they become a divided, tribal people. They've worshipped other gods, and because of that, all manner of corruption and violence and sin have taken hold. So God here draws the line in the sand. He allows people to be put under a severe discipline. Babylon marches into Jerusalem. The armies of Nebuchadnezzar lay, lace to the land, lay waste to the land. The temple of God now lies in ruins. In short, God does a bit of house cleaning. Now the future of God's people is not going to be what they thought it was going to be. And it's certainly not what they had hoped at this point. Even more concerning, what hope does the light have to make it into a broken world when even God's people are being
being placed under such a severe discipline. As Jesus says, when the light within you becomes darkness, how great is that darkness? A servant, simply a person that gets their master's will done. Right? Whatever the servant, whatever the master says for the servant to do, it's an easy job description. Just do it. Now God said to Isaiah, through this story, he's introducing his servant. He's reminding us of his ancient promise through Abraham and saying, let me tell you about the person that's going to get my will done. Now this person is going to be pretty important. Let's read together from Isaiah 42. The servant of the Lord. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout, he will not cry aloud in the streets or raise his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. In faithfulness, he will bring forth justice. He will not falter or be discouraged till he establishes the ju- his justice on earth. In his teaching, the islands will put up in their hope. This is what God the Lord says, the creator of the heavens who stretches them out, who spreads out the earth with all that springs from it, who gives breath to its people and life to those who walk on it. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and I will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light to the Gentiles. To open the eyes that are blind, to free the captives from prison and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. See the former things have taken place and new things I declare. Before they spring into being, I announce them to you. Uh, Those of you in the crowd that know your New Testament, right? you can certainly identify with what Isaiah is talking about and you uh, have already jumped ahead in in your mind in the story. But before we get there, let's hear Isaiah's words as they would have been received at that time. Now let's remember... God's people are 700 years before the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. They're receiving this word of a person that will get God's will done on the earth. Now this speaks to us and them in many ways. At most, it's a wonderful pattern of ministry for all of us that would like to see God's blessing flow here and to others on the earth. The question now is, how will that be accomplished? How is this blessing that God's referring to going to be released? Let's look at what God says. First, the character of God's servant. Notice that this person in this verse is upheld by God. Chosen by God. Loved by God. Being anointed by the Spirit of God. This person will bring justice to the nations. Now, this is not a court's kind of justice that we're used to. Rather, this is a meaning of restoring order. He will make what is wrong right. He will put things back in their right order. So the real question is, how can this be done? In such a disordered world that we live in, how can we put things back in their right order? How can the servant go about the, his ministry? Maybe he will begin by calling a big national press conference. Or maybe he'll launch a movement within the government. Maybe he'll seek to convert powerful and influential people. Maybe he should throw on a white suit and hit the road with a series of religious revivals. Notice in verse 2, the servant does none of these things. We are told in this verse that the one who gets God's will done and the means 
of, and will be the means of God's blessing in this world will not shout, will not cry aloud in the streets. God says the person that I'm going to use will have nothing of the showman or the promoter about him. He will have nothing of the power broker or the negotiator. He'll have nothing of the slick politician. He will not shout. He will not cry aloud in the streets. He will not be the person that dominates the room or shouts other people down so that His Word can be heard. In fact, the outstanding thing about God's person that He will use to be the vehicle of His blessing in this world will be the quietness of His ministry. He will get on to doing what God has asked without drawing any attention to Himself. Now this is sharp contrast to what we're used to in human leadership in the world today, is it not? The enemy came to Adam and Eve all those years ago and said, think what you can become. And prevailing notions of leadership in our culture today have a whole lot of think what you could become built into them. But here God says, the person that gets my will done and will be the vehicle of my blessing in the world will be distinguished by the quiet persistence of His ministry. Now someone said, God's artists do not put their pictures, uh, don't put their signatures rather, on pictures that they create. And I tell you who said it, but it would kind of spoil the guy's point. Um, but I think it's a, a, an awesome statement. But it also brings up a question, I think, for us. If the will of God doesn't get done by some fantastic program, or some mega personality, how does it get done? I'll point you to verse 3. The bruised reed he will not break, and the smoldering wick he will not snuff out. The point here is that you don't mend broken reeds. Right? If you've ever been walking by a riverbank, what do you do? You just kind of plow over them. Right? At minimum, if you see one broken off, you just kind of whack it off and level it down. Or if you're in my family, you break one off and you hit your sister in the back of the legs with it. Or, right, if you're at a dinner party and you've got some guests over and you have a candle on the table and that thing starts to smoke and burn out, what do you do? You snuff it out, you throw it in the trash and you put a brand new one on the table and you keep the dinner going. You will not be interrupted. Now God says, my servant will not be like that. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not snuff out. What a wonderful picture of patience, of healing, of compassion, of the ministry of the servant of God. Now our world, ladies and gentlemen, is full of broken reeds and smoldering wicks. No doubt that many of you here today fit this description. You've been bruised by this world. You've been hit by something so that you feel bent over. You feel you can barely stand up another week. It seems the weight of your life and of this world is simply more than you can bear. For others, you might identify with the smoldering wick. There was once a time you were a flame of passion for Jesus Christ. But circumstances have come into your life that have eroded your fuel. The inner resources of your life are running thin, and somehow you wonder if even the light that you have left can be sustained at all. Now the broken, the bruised, the smoldering wicks of this world will never respond to the loudmouth showman or the promoter. But the servant's ministry will be one of compassion, a quiet touching of individual people, individual lives that have been wounded with the compassion and the love and the very hand of God. Notice that the servant here is also faithful. He will not falter, it says. He will not be discouraged. He will minister to those that are discouraged. But the servant himself does not get discouraged. In fact, the servant of God will be marked 
by the staying power of the Lord Almighty. So here we are, ladies and gentlemen. We're a Christian congregation. We're serious about wanting to see God's will break out and His kingdom be expanded in the world. We want to see people's lives break out with God's blessings. Not only here at Simi Valley, but across the world. How is it to be done? It will not be done by some mega program or some slick personality. It will be done by the quiet, humble, compassionate ministry of men and women like you that faithfully stick to the task that God has called them to do. Often it will be unsung by human praise. Often it will not even be noticed. But we will take the time to reach those bruised, battered, and broken lives. This is the character of the servant of God. If each of you today would like to be useful in the hand of, hand of God, cultivate humility. Cultivate compassion. Cultivate faithfulness and perseverance. Do not be discouraged or falter until the will of God is established in this land. Christ is God's servant. We have faith in that. And what we cannot be, He will be for us. What no prophet could ever get done throughout the history of the Bible, Jesus Christ will achieve. In our last moments today, let's jump ahead in the story a bit. I'd like you to turn with me to Acts chapter 8. We'll be reading in verses 26 through 39. Philip and the Ethiopian. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way, he was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, and he said, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. This is the passage of Scripture he was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And we are 750 years past the time of Isaiah. At this point, we're after the Gospels. Jesus has ascended to heaven. The Holy Spirit has been sent to God's church. And we read of this man, this African man, a deeply religious man, traveling home and from his worship in Jerusalem. He's reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and Philip has been called to the right place at the right time by God. The man asked this Christian evangelist, he says, is he talking about himself or 
is he talking about someone else? Philip began the passage of Scripture and told him the good news of Jesus. No doubt about his crucifixion and how he was rejected by God's people. And no doubt how he died sacrificially for us. But I also think that he probably said, let me turn you back to chapter 42. Let me tell you about this Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the one who did not raise his voice in the streets or cry aloud. Let me tell you about this Samaritan woman who is a bruised reed, how he lifted her life. Let me tell you how he came to the smoldering wick of an old financial hard nut named Levi and changed the direction of his life forever and fanned the flame into being. Let me tell you how the glory of God was revealed in Jesus Christ and through his compassionate ministry, how he touched another and another and another and another. Ladies and gentlemen, as we close today, our call to action is to follow in the servant's footsteps. This week, let's be ready like Philip was when the Lord calls. And the Lord's going to call in all kinds of different ways. It's not going to come at the perfect time for you. Sorry. You're not going to be sitting there binge watching Netflix and, and God's going to come to you and just say, hey, since you have nothing to do today, i got something for you. It's not going to work like that. Be prepared to be inconvenienced. You're going to have to minister with somebody that it probably is not like you. It probably is somewhat aggravating at times. But God is calling you to do that. And our job is to answer that call, whatever it may be. It might be ministering to somebody. It might be filling communion cups. It might be painting. It might be teaching little kids. It might be sending an email. It might be going and finding somebody today that that you haven't seen in a while and talking with them. Knowing that somebody in our congregation is sick and just saying, hey, I hope you feel better. It could be any one of those ministries. There's a lot of ways to be involved in God's kingdom. And it's not always going to be at the perfect time and it's not always going to be convenient. Imagine if Philip had told God, "Ah, the desert road, it's hot. You know, can't you just talk to the other guy that's in that town? You know, he could intercept him as he's on his way there. Then I wouldn't have to go south. You know, maybe somebody else could do it. No. All it says is Philip got up and went. So my ask of our congregation today as we go into the week is to be open, to cultivate this humility, this compassion, this faithfulness that the servant has exemplified. To not think that it's somebody else's job in God's kingdom, that it's your job in God's kingdom. To seek and find out what He would will for you to do. And then to finally be prepared to be inconvenienced, Be prepared for it not to be the right time. And finally, be prepared for no one to notice. For no one to say thank you. For no one to say good job. But to do it anyway. Because that's what Jesus Christ did. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a need today, if you want to re-fan the flame of your life, if you're a bruised or broken reed today, and you're bent over and the weight feels too heavy. There is a place of compassion. There is a place of faithfulness. There is a place of humility at the footsteps of Jesus Christ today for you. And if you'd like to grab that, come see any of us. You're going to come up front. I know it's a little weird to come up front sometimes, right? You know, like come in front in front of everybody. But if you get done with this service and you are a bro- bruised reed or you're a broken wick, or broken reed, bru- smoldering wick, Getting confused here? That means I've run too long. I need to, I need to wrap it up. Um, come and see us. And let's tell you about this Jesus Christ. Come as we stand in the